listeners, and welcome back to the Third Wave Podcast. I'm actually recording this from Amsterdam. I am in Martijn's living room. Uh, my co-founder of Synthesis, we actually just ran one of our retreats last weekend, the weekend of July 27th through 29, and we're about to gear up for another one. So we're running now legal psilocybin retreats in Amsterdam. It's a really fun, exciting project, and I'm pretty amped. Uh, from the past weekend uh, with all the transformation that we saw and the experiences that people had in coming to sit with us in ceremony. So that was a really beautiful experience um, and still processing that. And that leads into the intro for today, which I recorded last week at the Assemblage, a kind of co-working space in New York City. And it's an interview with Sophia Roekland, who is an independent researcher exploring the political economy and ecology of psychoactive plants and the author of a forthcoming book on the global spread of ayahuasca. Now, I met Sophia last year at Horizons. I remember this woman stood up, long blonde hair, and asked a very good question. I don't remember what it was, but a very good question for the panel at the end of Horizons and then ended up meeting her later that night and we spoke. And then ever since then, we've been friends and had some really good conversations about various topics related to ayahuasca, related to plant medicine, how psychedelics are developing, general cultural things, particularly in New York City. And so I thought it'd be great to invite her into the podcast and go a little bit deeper into some of these topics, uh, formalize some of what we were talking about and try to come to some understanding or conclusions of this uh, dynamic relationship b between um, the commercialization of ayahuasca, the globalization of ayahuasca, uh, and how that relates to what will likely be a higher and higher demand for psychedelics in the future. And so we get into some fascinating topics. We kind of stuffed inside, uh, stuffed ourselves inside a cramped, Got a meeting booth at the assemblage. I set up my Blue Yeti mic and we just went for about an hour, hour and a half. So I think you'll really enjoy this conversation. And as always, if you do enjoy it, or if not, just please leave us a review on iTunes or any other listening service that you happen to download from. So without further ado, Sophia Roeklin. <laughs> Let's just jump right in and I'd love yeah. to hear a little bit more about what you're like most excited about right now. So what are you working on that's going on, particularly with psychedelics, that you're just like chomping at the bit? Well, right now I'm chomping on my first book. It's called When Plants Dream and it's coming out next year. I'm co-authoring it with Daniel Pinchbeck and we're kind of exploring the different cultural reinterpretations of ayahuasca as it spreads across the world. And we take a very, you know, I think we're only able to tell our perspectives of it. So it's a very global north centric perspective. And we sort of say that. And yeah, we cover the literature, the different sort of media um, interpretations that we've seen, interviewed everyone from entrepreneurs to lawyers to shamans, and just trying to understand the different narratives that people have about the significance of ayahuasca spreading across the world right now. So. And what are, like, sneak peek? Yeah, sure. What, <laughs> what, like, what are some of those narratives that, yeah. are, that are developing? Within I mean, the one that's space? particularly interesting to me is there's, um, you know, this idea of the plant teacher, right? This idea that um, psychedelic plants are sentient and animate beings with agency. Um, many people who try ayahuasca for the first time report feeling like they've been in contact with some sort of an intelligent entity that is not human. And for many people, that may be like their first time having that experience. So that opens up a whole Pandora's box of, wow, our, is the world is animate, the world is enchanted. Um, and then from that sort of opening of perspective comes this idea, this anthropomorphized perspective of ayahuasca, right? As a mother, as a grandmother, as a tool. There are different words that people use to describe it, her, the medicine, um, being, and you know, that I, some people will say that it's like a chemical SOS, a pheromonal signal that's coming from the Amazon in order to bring attention to deforestation or for us to heal our more materialistic behaviors or our more hurtful behaviors. Um, 
So that's like one of the main kind of narratives that we see. Right Which reminds now. me a little bit of what Dennis McKenna has, mm-hmm. has spoken mm-hmm. about. He talks a lot about how he had this really deep ayahuasca experience where basically the the medicine told him to kind of wake up. The, something about monkeys and waking up and about, you know, yeah, ecocide. And, and, yeah, yeah, that's, 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 that's the quote <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. And it also reminds me of a piece I was recently reading on Aeon. I don't know if you've seen mm-hmm. this piece yeah. by Jules Evans. I haven't who wrote about is psychedelics really a new scientific framework or is it a new a theological framework with kind of the larger goals of the psychedelic, particularly subculture renaissance right now going on, where it's really about, I think, birthing a new paradigm uh, where we transition as a species from a lot of these destructive narratives into kind of this regenerative ecosystem that really pays attention to indigenous wisdom as well as uh, modern technology. And so that was also a really interesting look because he referred specifically to ayahuasca in there and Mm -hmm. the sense of it, you know, having this kind of anthropomorphized motherly dynamic. What has been your experience with that when you've either, you know, participated or just through your research, how credible do you find that to be or what would it, what's your take on it? I've said this before, but I'm decidedly undecided. I feel like because I've been so immersed in different research about it, I myself don't know where I locate myself in it, but my experiences that I have had with ayahuasca or yahe in the upper Amazon, um, when I was 18, 19, I went to go visit the Sequoia tribe and they live in the northeastern Ecuadorian Amazon. Um, and the Sequoia are part of like a Tucano ethno-linguistic group. So the Sinua, the Kofan are nearby. And these are just like most very kind of masculine traditions. There's this less sort of... Um, essentialized soft feminine quality and you don't see people talking about yahe as a woman actually so I've my closer experiences have been through that I wasn't really exposed to the narrative that ayahuasca was the mother or something when I first experienced it um and as such I didn't I didn't feel it in that kind of gendered way if that makes sense but it does raise a lot of interesting questions and this is the point that Jules Evans was making in Mm. this piece was one of the reasons that psychedelics for example now facilitate mystical experiences was because Bill Richards who is the Johns Hopkins researcher um, who was working on this stuff in the 60s he took that narrative of the relationship between psychedelics and non-dual experiences and then they specifically created a container at Johns Hopkins Mm. to facilitate that exact experience. So I think one of the big questions is how do the assumptions that we come to this experience with then dictate the actual outcome that we're after? And I think I'd be curious to hear you talk more about, um, you know, within that framework, why is it that then ayahuasca has this or supposedly this motherly quality to it? So where did that sort of narrative develop? I think you've probably heard this idea that psychedelics have sometimes been called non-specific amplifiers. I think Stanislav Grof was Mm -hmm. the dude who said that. Yeah, Yeah. so with this idea, then you think, okay, well, maybe there isn't like an inherent goodness or an inherent badness to these substances. And yet, I feel like especially with ayahuasca, people do assign the sort of inherent benevolence. And this has come through especially in marketing tactics right so you will for example receive a miracle you will have a transformational experience etc etc and you kind of get what you pay for right i mean if you're going into it believing that that that's likely gonna you know shape your experience same thing if you fall in love and you say this is going to be the love of my life like you'll think that for a little while until something leads you to believe otherwise right so suggestibility Um, that sometimes comes up to me as like these tools as non-specific amplifiers Mm -hmm. significantly increase suggestibility Mm -hmm. which is on on the one side like the positive side why intention is so important set and setting going into the experience But also on on the dark side, and maybe this is something we can dig further into, is why you have things like, you know, what happened with Charles Manson, for example, in the 60s, where then they can also be utilized as tools for kind of more dark energy. And I know this is the case with ayahuasca as well, I believe, in the Amazon. Yeah, I've I've been particularly interested in looking at the yin yang of these traditions. I remember once a man in the Amazon said to me, I had this, I kept having this recurring vision of this, I was having beautiful visions and I was flying through, you know, beautiful, enchanting cities. And then a big black curtain 
would just fall over my visions and it felt super dramatic. And I, I came to him and I said, you know, what's happening with this? And he says, it's yin yang. You just go through the darkness, right? You can't, you can't ignore the darkness. You can't push it away or something like that. You have to see through it. So I think that shamanism is always shading into sorcery. I've noticed that it, it, people ignore this. People ignore that this is a reality of it because we want it to be a new healing thing. And I think that this is what happens, especially when psychedelics at large are, you know, explored through a medical framework because it's a, it's a medicine, right? And they are medicines, all, like, of course, but the poison is in the dose. And I think that that's what's so interesting about it, actually. Psychedelics are so kind of unpredictable. And that's the beauty of them. They, they create spontaneous healing. And, you know, two people can have the same dose of ayahuasca and have completely different experiences. And that's that there's a lot of beauty to that. And sometimes I wonder, in our pursuit to legalize and normalize and kind of mainstream these substances, are we, you know, setting ourselves up for a sort of situation where we take out those variables and where you need to have a pill that always works. And so what is coming up on the horizon? Obviously, you wrote a piece about this for mm -hmm. Tracuna, which we will reference in the show notes for this. And I was reading through it just before I came over, uh, which you more or less outlined some of the dark sides of now the increasing medicalization, but also commercialization mm -hmm. of psychedelics. What were some of your you know, main takeaways or some things that you dug into in that piece? Yeah, I mean, I think there are definitely a few of them. One of them is removing, I don't want to say I'm a purist, but I'll, I'll kind of explain why there's a certain thing. In, in um, Stefan Bayer wrote this amazing book called Singing to the Plant. So I, I draw upon his work when I say this. Um, you know, when we kind of try to isolate one favorable aspect of something, we tend to neglect the whole ecology of things that play into how that thing works. So, for example, you know, maybe I just take ayahuasca, but the ayahuasquero may be singing Icaros, there may be smells, there may be sort of relationships that you have in that room that create multidimensional experience that really imprints on your consciousness that makes it such a profound experience. And I also think that when we increasingly sort of medicalize these things, we take out the element of catharsis. So in Greek, catharsis means to purge, actually, right? It's like the same thing so if we're saying you know we're going to microdose with ayahuasca it's like i'm just going to have the frosting on this and that's fine in some cases but the question is is that necessarily doing the medicine justice we often ask the question what can these things do for us but not what we can do for them and i think that because we're now sort of I speak for myself, right? Having having come, I was born and raised in New York City and I came from, you know, my neighbors were skyscrapers and small Yorkies. I didn't grow up with big evergreens and things. So after having taken psychedelics, I sort of had this experience that the, the earth asks things of us, you know, plants begin to kind of indicate to you when they're thirsty or when they want more light. And it requires a specific perspective to see that. So that's my hope is that it's we don't necessarily have a sort of extractive um, attitude towards these medicines. They're going to be so good for us, et cetera, et cetera. But how can we give back to them? And then that sort of bleeds into the whole sustainability conversation with some of these entheogenic plants. So let's pick that apart a little bit. I think there's like three main things within that. I'd first like to hear you talk a little bit about what's What's happening so far in the psychedelic space that represents to you just a renewal or a um, a repeat of, you know, the extractive economy that's been based on uh, that, that industrial capitalism has been based on for the last few hundred years. Mm -hmm. So in other words, what's developing in the psychedelic space right now that you see as potentially dangerous because mm -hmm. of these reasons. I would, I'm speaking about these things simply because I hope for the resilience of these movements. You know, sometimes I wonder, like, there's a fine line between cynicism and critique. So I say this in hope of actually making these things better. Right? Sure. I went to the Sacred Plants Conference in Ajijic in Mexico last um, spring, early. Yeah. That was one that Bia organized. Mm -hmm. right? okay. Yeah, it, it was, was in Spanish. It was and... incredible. Mm -hmm. It was so cool. It was the most sort of age diverse, multidisciplinary. It was really, really an impressive conference. But there, there was a woman, um, I believe she was a Huichol woman from Mexico. And she stood up in tears. And she said, you know, this is all very nice. But 
peyote is our access point to our ancestors and Western people come here for a novel experience and uh, we can't find them anymore. They're disappearing, you know, and I know that Bia has done a lot of research on this as well. Um, and again, with ayahuasca, for example, this is a little bit more of contested territory. Ayahuasca is a vine. It's not like the little cactus and it grows like crazy. Um, however, I have, you know, had a really intense interview with a guy. Um, he lives in a tributary south of Iquitos and he told me that um, there was this old, old ayahuasca vine, a Benisteriopsis, that was growing in the village. And for many, many years, they don't know for how long, but for generations, people would come and sit at the foot of the vine and they would sing to the vine. Mm -hmm. And they would shake it and a piece of the vine would drop down. And that was the piece that the vine offered. And one night, um, somebody came and just hacked the vine down to the root. Mm -hmm. And... That vine presumably is now being sold in the Belen markets in Iquitos for, you know, not much. Right. And then you begin to wonder, um, when we do, I don't want to say evangelize, but when you do have this sort of perspective, everybody needs to try ayahuasca, let's, we should put it in Donald Trump's Gatorade. I've heard that more than once. <laughs> yeah. That would be a disgusting Gatorade, but I think, you know, it might... I mean, I might. <laughs> hey, I, I, new, new flavors. New maybe. flavors. The, the new ayahuasca flavor for Gatorade. That's going to totally be a thing. Yeah, hashtag. That'll totally be a thing. <laughs> but yeah, in any case, so these are the things I think about. It's ultimately, with regards to sustainability, um, yeah, I know that Chris Killam is doing research right now. You recently spoke with him. Yeah, I interviewed him for the podcast a couple mm -hmm. months ago, and we had talked about this exact topic, mm -hmm. about the possible, like, extinction of ayahuasca and he's basically going down because there's actually no research that's been done on this so yeah, far that's right. so he's actually trying to discover um, what might be the case but you know when I think about this as well uh, I also think about the the paradigm of a lot of these substances are doing similar things to mm -hmm. us as humans so DMT which is the psychoactive component of ayahuasca is a tryptamine just like psilocybin is a tryptamine and so oftentimes when people hear or talk about you know this extractive economy uh, that's taking ayahuasca and basically selling it to Westerners. My first kind of response to that is, well, we should just get more people on mushrooms because mushrooms grow really fast. They grow everywhere. There won't be any issues ever with, oh, we don't have enough mushrooms because of how quick they can reproduce. So that's just always the, the framework through which I think of things. But at the same time, clearly ayahuasca has a, a cultural context. And so although it's easy as a Westerner to say that, I think it's clear that in the Amazon in particular, that ecosystem, there's concerns about fragility when it comes to this medicine. Yeah, the conversation about even ayahuasca analogs, for example, is very big. But Part of the yeah, the tricky thing with that is that ayahuasca does have a sort of multi-dimensional shamanic framework that, you know, we don't see with um, mushrooms anymore. I mean, traditionally we may have with Maria Sabina, but unfortunately now that's not so much the case. So with the mushrooms, we reinvent our new rituals, right? Which is amazing because for me, psychedelics offer a rite of passage. And this, I think, is the thing that we all you know, regardless of our long-term visions of psychedelics, really admire about them is that um, they sort of teach us, they, they blur the boundaries between material and spiritual, between self and other, and teach us what it is to be human in a way that right now we've kind of lost those rituals in our globalized industrial society. Um, so, yeah, the thing is, is that, you know, when we talk about just ayahuasca, we're also talking about this immense body of vegetalismo, of, you know, plant medicine and doctoring with plants, um, which is, in my at least limited knowledge of it, pretty, it's, we don't see it in many other places around the world because of the Amazon's immense, you know, biodiversity. We have so many plants there. Let's dig a little bit further into globalization, industrialization. As demand rises for psychedelics because we have the scientific research that shows they're effective at treating depression PTSD from your understanding how does the economic aspect play out to support that need and demand without having ayahuasca go extinct it's a great question I mean I think before the economic question comes um, a question of the narratives that we tell about these medicines right so I've seen that overwhelmingly in mainstream media, on CNN, the Wall Street Journal, wherever people are publishing these gonzo reports, the reality of indigenous people living in these situations is often situated as like an, an end note or something, right? You say, yes, I go to the Amazon rainforest and I have this experience, 
But they often fail to mention that on their way down that river, they also saw huge barges with petrol and logs and these things. It's sort of like very myopic perspective. So I think as people who are advocates of psychedelics, who are researchers, that's our job to actually be sort of bringing a more holistic awareness of the impacts maybe of spiritual tourism um, and not only the impacts, but actually the opportunity we have to be helping you know, indigenous people demarcate territory. I mean, I've, I've seen a couple of times when people are like, I just need a couple of grand to secure this land so Nestle doesn't buy a Timica cacao plantation. Very simple stuff, right? We could be helping people more legal defense cases. ICERS, for example, in Barcelona has been doing great with the Legal Defense Fund. And I would love to see something like that, but actually legal defense fund for people in the Amazon fighting environmental justice cases. So things like that. I feel like there's a lot of opportunity for reciprocity in our awareness, which would then turn into an economic reciprocity, if that makes sense. Yeah. And how would that economic reciprocity play out or how would you envision that? I think it's a romantic idea or naive to think that we could go back to like a bartering economy in the Amazon. You know, traditionally, Kenneth Tupper talks a lot about this in his essays on the political economy of ayahuasca. And he says, traditionally, healers would offer a bundle of tobacco or a chicken and such, and they would they would get the healing in exchange. And now people are in a for profit. I mean, they need money. Right. So with that, I think that, again, I'm not an expert on it, but I imagine that some priorities in the Amazon, my my time working with the Rainforest Foundation, which is an NGO who works with communities out in the forest, um, it's really important to secure food sovereignty and energy sovereignty. So that way these you know people who do offer us their medicines in exchange, we help with basic life tools like clean water and like having land to farm and to hunt or whatever that may be. And these things are pretty, I mean, they're complicated, but they're also quite intuitive and simple. And I don't think it's brought up enough in the conversation on ayahuasca. It's like this miraculous thing that just floats without any kind of like cultural context is what I'm saying. Which of course has all these potentially negative consequences when it comes to destruction of a lot of these areas that the ayahuasca is, Mm -hmm. is grown in because you have Western tourists who are flying down there, who are paying, you know, high sums of money, like mm-hmm. you were emphasizing, uh, with really, I think, not a clear recognition of how that's actually supporting the larger ecosystem of where ayahuasca comes from. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. But again, I mean, more than anything, I feel optimistic. I really do. I've always felt very passionate about the rainforest ever since I was a little kid, and I learned about it in National Geographic, and I had my, you know, whatever perspective on it. It's like. It's not a niche consideration to think that the the Amazon rainforest produces more than 20% of our oxygen. Um, it, it's home to more biodiversity than anywhere else on Earth. I mean, it would be a real shame if we just didn't pull it together and helped people protect their lands. And we know that quantitatively indigenous people who have their land titles protect the land the best. So suddenly we see a clear link here, right? What if the whole ayahuasca globalization narrative came with a commensurate emphasis on saying, hey, like, and guess what? We're going to put 10% of proceeds from our uh, retreat centers as soon as people obviously start making enough to support themselves. It's like we're going to start putting it into um, language revitalization programs or women's health programs or whatever that may be. And again, not coming from a sort of American development, we know best perspective. I certainly hope that's not the case because that framework is definitely not going to help. What is the kind of American development yeah. thing and how is that different than what people could do with, you know, their own money locally in, in the Amazon? Mm-hmm. There's a scholar, um, Ivan Ilich, and he, he said he wrote this amazing paper. It was an address to young college students going to do study abroads. And he said, to hell with good intentions. So basically, a lot of the times people from the global north will go to the global south with the best of intentions. They want to help. And I haven't experienced this actually canvassing in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. And there was a woman who said to me, these NGOs came, we asked for clean water, and they gave us new fences. So sometimes without close enough conversation with local people, you know, we know best sort of situation because we have data, because we're futurists, because whatever story we tell ourselves, we know better. Um, So 
that's a very tough thing, sort of fostering intercultural conversation while at the same time relinquishing our legacy of being at the helm of globalized civilization, being, you know, in New York City, right? Um, right? And saying, we don't know, but we're just here, we're humble. And like, if you need a fundraise, we'll use those tools. If we need a campaign, we'll use those tools. But creating a clear channel of like conversation. And what better way to do that than with ayahuasca? Suddenly there's like a wide open door where never before have CEOs and hedge fund managers and such been interested in Amazonian shamanism. And that's, I think, one element that I'd love to kind of now transition into is we've been talking a little bit about the commercialization of right psychedelics and, and ayahuasca in particular. What are some of your concerns with developing things around like uh, microdosing, uh, around, you know, for-profit companies within this space? So I already mentioned Compass Pathways. I think it also goes without mentioning that I'm now running a for-profit retreat mm -hmm. in in, in Amsterdam for psilocybin. So I'd love to hear more about just from your understanding, like the Western perspective, or I think what you're referring to as the global North, mm -hmm. you know, what are some of your concerns in terms of how those narratives are developing in the for-profit psychedelic space right now? In other words, maybe touching on accessibility. So for example, we know that the therapy that MAPS is rolling out is going to be extremely expensive and likely won't be covered by insurance initially. So yeah, I just would love to hear a little bit more from mm. you. There's a great meme, psychedelic LSD in the 1960s used to take down the system, <laughs> you know, LSD in 2017 used to be more productive for our bosses. So I think what I hope for, for people who, you know, like you, who talk about microdosing is, yes, we may be enhancing creativity and productivity, but what for? I think that little extra bit is the question that might not get asked enough. I'd love to hear what you think if people are using these as tools, so to say, to facilitate awakening in some cases, to facilitate, as we said, maturation and initiation. Mm -hmm. But even if they're using tools like microdosing for general enhancement, for creativity and, and productivity, mm -hmm. from your perspective, what can business do to actually have a significant positive impact on communities, on the world, in particular with, you know, thinking of like psychedelics within that framework? I mean, I definitely don't have, I wouldn't go so far as to say I have those answers, but I have a particular leaning towards social justice issues. Not, again, for me, I have a particular leaning towards looking at people living in agrarian landscapes who live closely with the earth. Because, you know, it's a it's an issue that is actually important to all of us to have healthy ecosystem, to mitigate climate change, to have carbon sinks, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, what I hope for is that businesses at least take these things into consideration. And it's not just business as usual, kind of creating cool technological gizmos and gadgets that still require, um, you know, titanium mining from South Africa, right? It's still... I think we can ask ourselves with this new LSD vision to use those superpowers to get, to gaze into the future and to say what are what are the ultimate impacts? What is the whole production chain of my work? Where do these materials come from? Uh, who sources them? How much longer can we be drawing them for? Um, and then really from there creating regenerative, cool solutions to kind of divert or at least rewrite that narrative that we have of a highly entropic and extractive economy as it were what's an entropic economy can yeah you, can you so, explain that yeah the idea of entropy is basically that um a hundred percent of energy will never come back once we use it so we live in a world where you know we're going to have diminishing returns when we extract something it will never fully come back if that makes sense so if you live in a planet in a in a limited biosphere you you have finite resources and yet we have you know an economic system that treats our we have a gdp that asks that we increase the amount of products that we make and we sell etc cetera, etc cetera. so there seems to be a deep deep logical fallacy there and this is an issue that really is everyone's involved in, right? So how can we all put our heads together and start to think about that? And I have faith that microdosing, psychedelics, all of these movements can really start to think, you know, in terms of economic exchanges and sovereignty and just new, cool, creative ways that don't just cement the status quo. And what is the status quo, according to you? I'm seated upon privilege here, but mm -hmm. I think that there is this idea that we need to be 
infinitely productive, making more, buying more, doing more, getting more, 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 yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Um, and how cool would it be to not do that anymore? Oh, how naive I may be. <laughs> but I don't know. I mean, I've definitely met many people. If you look at these neuro, you know, pastoral movements, I've met tons of people. I mean, half of my homies from Occupy Wall Street are living out in farms now. Right. And it's very interesting pattern with people who drink ayahuasca. They've been on a track to, you know, do that whole metropolitan successful thing. And then they just decide to hunker down with babies and fruit trees instead. So I do think that there is a definitely like a, a shift in the way that people's values and perspectives change, especially with plant medicines. But that also comes with the narrative that we tell about plant medicines. So like we said before, LSD was once used to destabilize you know, the empire, and now it's used, you know, in Silicon Valley to just build apps in cooler and faster ways. And which is why it's so important, again, that these are tools of suggestibility. Yes. And these are tools that are not specific amplifiers. Mm -hmm. So this is something that even as someone who's a more public figure about microdosing, who's going to tech conferences to speak at, at who's basically has a public platform that people are identifying and recognizing, I think I've made it my choice to really help build a narrative around transitioning from these extractive economies and business practices that are mm -hmm. rooted in that. In other words, an unbending push towards productivity and towards growth and towards oftentimes like building. And how do we actually use these as tools and align them with things like artificial intelligence and uh, the rise of basically, uh, potentially UBI, mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. ideally we're using them as tools for creativity, for tapping into flow states, so that what used to take us eight hours on a normal workday, because we have like 40 hour work weeks, now takes three to four hours, right? And so this is this gets really to the importance then of what psychedelics do, which to me, they often represent this opportunity to actually like know the self, like the true self really well. And I see that as being the the significant sort of um, what's a way to put this like this is kind of what you're hitting at when you talk about how people are now recognizing that the doing process is not working for them anymore that they followed the traditional path they went to Yale they started working at a law firm they became partner and they thought that just by continuing to climb this ladder they would be happy and they now recognize that that was a poor model so mm -hmm. to say, mm -hmm. that in fact, true happiness and contentment comes from uh, relationship yeah, and comes from being mm -hmm. in the world mm -hmm. and, and having that balance between being and doing. Mm -hmm. This seems to be the larger conversation that's happening. The new infrastructure that's being built around work is how do you help people find work that's deeply purpose-driven and meaningful? And I think as that conversation continues, it's just going to align with all these other things that we're talking about because I think at the end as humans, the way that we've been evolutionary built is to have a relationship with the earth. And that the longer we ignore that, the worse, like the mental health crisis is gonna get, mm -hmm. the worse, you know, like all this other shit that's going on. So I almost mm -hmm. see these as, you know, these tools are coming around at the, the right time. I mean, some people do say like, wow, psychedelics right now, it's like the time has come, right? There's this big kind of, renaissance and it's our right to come back as humans to cognitive liberty right to be able to think and feel and do as we as humans as plant takers and livers with just can be it's like pretty cool time like the other thing that i'm recognizing some of these uh patterns that are going on are like on the one hand you do have these people who are trying to return to a more pastoral side of things on the other hand, you have the biohacking mm. tech crowd who want to utilize AI to become gods, to basically supersede our homo sapien nature mm. and move into a space where it is about never ending productivity, mm -hmm. growth and building. Your, what are your thoughts on that? My MO is as an anthropologist, so I love to study like mm. the different stories, the different cosmovisions, orientating stories that people tell themselves. And you clearly see that, especially in 
the psychedelics movement, but also just in activist movements more broadly, people who are, you know, quote unquote, doing things, you see romanticized indigenous futures, right? This yearning to go back to some sort of a simplified and holistic past. I think the archaic revival exactly. is what Terrence McKenna <laughs> called it. Yeah, yeah. yeah classic. We're just going to keep wanting to go back. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's make America great again. Uh-huh. But really, though, right? I mean, think yeah. about it. Um, and then you also have this kind of techno-utopian, accelerated AI so and so forth, kind of, we can create accelerated technologies to accelerate solutions, perspectives. Mm -hmm. I hope that there's kind of a middle path, and I've actually seen that in, I think of this amazing um, artwork by this woman, Sarah Flores, and she's um, she's Shipiba. She's an artist, and she she did this project with the Shipibo Konibo project called Kimera, and they're these Shipibo Kene tapestries, so if, if it's kind of like now it's like a worldwide ayahuasca motif, these tapestries. of yeah. They're kind of woven into geometric patterns, and they can be actually read like songs. They're these vibrations, puro sonido, the pure sound of the language that the plants speak. And so Sarah actually etched QR codes into these tapestries um, as a sort of political statement to say that indigenous people are also modern people, right? We don't have to be tied to this idea that we are somehow like the beginning and what does indigenous even mean i mean they've been they crossed the bering strait yada 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 so yeah i think that's part of it so you and i were speaking a little bit earlier on just the plurality now that the psychedelics movement is getting older i think you and i are part of a new generation of people our work is upon the backs of those who have been seriously i mean they've been put in jail they've been ostracized i i really don't know but there's certainly many many different perspectives here and it's cool to see that you can have people even like you and i who do have some different ideas of how to how we're going forward with psychedelics we still have a mutual appreciation for the fact that they bring us back to being the best human we can be through these rites of passage and that's what i term i think the self-optimization process yeah. Yeah. which is yeah. where i get some pushback and some shit from people in the psychedelic space yeah and i'm like be your true yeah. essential self yeah and then you get into like the personal development stuff yeah. and kind of the tony robbins ask movement tony robbins yeah. by the way recommends ayahuasca oh apparently. recommends as part of his platinum coaching Are you serious? process yeah it's like Thanks in there for that. But like the really <laughs> high-end stuff he'll like recommend people go do ayahuasca mm-hmm. And this is becoming increasingly increasingly popular in, in mm-hmm. the spheres. I've talked to at least four executive coaches or five who are now with Michael Pollan's new book. All these people are coming out of the woodwork and being like, oh, I'm really interested in this. Right. How do I get involved with this? Mm-hmm. And, you know, my big thing is as a pragmatist, as someone who's very yes. practical minded and oriented towards like what's going to work. I always look for kind of the, the carrot on the stick, so to say. Mm-hmm. In other words, how do you get people to, to start to engage with you? And then through that process, how do you bring them along to a new story that actually is really what they're after? And I think that is potentially what, you know, psychedelics could do in the business space is you have a lot of people who are running companies who are frankly miserable and they're starting to recognize that like being miserable is a choice. And they're looking at these tools to help with that. And I think that's a fantastic opportunity to, to just like completely change organizational culture and how people actually relate to their companies, how people relate to the earth through those companies, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But you could even look at this, and I think that's totally right. I feel like some people, especially when they do have their psychedelic experience, they're they're either on the boat or they're off the boat, meaning you're either with the society project or you're not, right? You see people who just peace out, they're done, they don't want to be a part of it. And something that is awesome about being an entrepreneur despite being a minority in the psychedelic space is that you're saying hey like this is what we're working with let's do it so then the question is how do you invite people who have kind of jumped off the ship to say what have you learned over there what have you learned about farming what have you learned about ecology what have you learned about your new perspectives and maybe creating you know hybridized um, economic indicators so instead of gdp using other factors like the well-being of the earth how much ocean acidification happens how much arable land is left how much carbon do we emit into the atmosphere i mean these are projects that people are working on already but right now they're considered sort of like heterodox or weird or alternative um and that's what i hope ultimately would be that would be awesome if somehow 
that kind of consciousness would be brought into the consciousness movement. Can you clarify that a little yeah. bit more? Do you mean the consciousness of like the recognition that we come to in psychedelics in terms of being interconnected to everything? Or do you mean the consciousness of like quantitative measurements of actually like how are we seeing tangible change? Yeah, the, the latter. I think okay. more looking at really looking at the operating system, like the economic operating system. It has nothing to do with math. Like, you know, it has every, everybody can have access to it. Mm-hmm. It's just basic to me, um, kind of understanding that I come from a school of thought. And if you want to read more about this, there's the rules. Um, the rules is an amazing activist group. And they just kind of have been working on a post growth economic conversation. We're saying that, you know, there are limits to economic growth right now. And how can we create new, uh, diverse economies in a way that is resilient and sustainable? Um, and, I would be excited to have that conversation go into the psychedelic conversation more because right now um, it's extremely medicalized and it's ex- and with that because we're you know working to legitimize these things in mainstream culture, it's also extremely individualized. And when we continue to say, well, we're gonna solve this thing, this diagnosis for this person for this illness, you you still. F- working you're still treating within a very individual thing and you're not working on well what's the issue with this person's community what's the issue with their access to food to water to other psychedelics for example but that's not to say that people aren't thinking about it i think that the people at maps i think all of these people are really like have an incredibly sophisticated and wide breadth of understanding of how multidimensional all of this is so my hope is that we can graduate now from just the extremely medicalized book i mean look at pollen's book right mm-hmm. it was a huge hit because he spoke to us in the mainstream language of the rational educated people of the United States, which is medicine. Mm -hmm. You can't argue with medicine. You can't argue with the science. He's not talking about like sexuality and rubbing against plants and how his LSD experience was so cool. It's all about hard science. So now let's talk about rubbing against plants. Right. right. And I think that's that's ultimately like what I hear a lot of these conversations come back to. Mm. It's like, what's going to be the most effective Trojan horse? To actually get people in mainstream culture <laughs> mm. to like start to buy into this, you know, because I think it is a matter of a, a little bit of magic. So mm. to say where a lot of us who have gone through this experience recognize the need for it and the validity of it as well. And we have now that validity with the clinical research they've done at places like Johns Hopkins on how psilocybin can induce a quote unquote mystical experience. But how do you get a rational Western science minded materialist reductionist framework? And help people to step outside of that and actually recognize that we're not just this atomized thing that's separate from everything else, but that in fact, we're basically like energy vibrations coalescing for a periods of time and then dispersing again. Mm. The big question that a lot of this rests on is how do you reintegrate spirituality into modern life without the dogma of religion? And I think that's a big issue because I think at the root of a lot of these systemic issues that we deal with, mm. particularly around mental health, it is about, you know, food, food access or water access or, you know, communities, particularly that have been ravished by the war on drugs. Right. But I think the, the larger thing that it's about is what Nietzsche spoke about in the late 19th century, which is that God is dead and that we don't have any systems like yeah. th- this whole thing. The whole this is all mounting up now because for the past 110 years we've been going through like an existential crisis Mm -hmm. uh, as western civilization and we just don't know how to get out of it and there's a lot of people pointing to well if you just go further down that rabbit hole of materialist reductionism (laughs) eventually and and i think a lot of us in the psychedelic space are saying no you actually have to look at this in a completely new way right and contrary to popular belief right Nietzsche was very sad when he said he said god is dead like wtf you know yeah, I mean, my, my interviews that I've had with people who have drank ayahuasca for the first time, I call them first generation ayahuasca drinkers. You, Lots of people experience some sort of a death, right? Um, these ego death experiences. You, you drink a lot of medicine and you feel this intense fear and then you relinquish that and then you come back with a revitalized and amazing sense of what it is to be alive. And that's enough that returning back to being alive is the God, as it were, you know, people. And then there's there isn't that much dogma that comes after that. I mean, some people do say, yes, I saw Jesus or yes, I saw Moses. 
it's a lot. I mean, I've, I've had people say that, but it still is this like that ancient, ancient cycle that humans have had to kind of almost kill themselves yeah. in that way. Right. And then return. Well, that's the process. Uh, that's a ritual of initiation. Mm -hmm. And that's what psychedelics have been used. What I kind of have been have been terming like the first wave of psychedelic use. That's largely been their utility and usefulness is they're a much safer route for that near death experience. than like I was just talking to a friend a couple of days ago who just had like an operation and she was like allergic to something in the operation and like almost died in the operating table. Oh my God. And so obviously psychedelics are a much safer route than these other near-death experiences that people would often go through. I mean, the one that comes to mind for me is like, have you ever seen um, 300, the movie about, I know what you're talking about Ancient like, Sparta, where the like the guy goes out in the beginning and he has to like, like a 12-year-old boy has to go kill a wolf in the woods or whatever. Like that was their initiation. Mm -hmm. Psychedelics are a bit more chill. I think. But that, you know. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sometimes. I mean, you, again, you see these guys who take Bayi, who take like Datura. Mm. There's nothing chill about that, man. Mm. You're really like on the brink there. Um, That's true. I didn't think about that. Yeah. yeah. That's what I hope isn't lost. I think we should keep psychedelics a rite of passage. Like print it on a t-shirt. Keep psychedelics weird and keep them a rite of passage. Because without that, I think we are kind of losing the plot here. Like... And, and again, this kind of circles back into the whole commodification conversation. When we make it more palatable to the masses, yes, we take out the vomiting. Yes, we take out the crying and the shitting. But what we also leave out is that amazing feeling of coming back with a renewed perspective on life, which brings us back to being better people, hopefully. Is it appropriate? to mainstream psychedelics, or this is the point that Bia emphasized, uh, Bia Labate, when I was speaking with her last week, or will psychedelics just remain weird? And what's the balance between those two in providing healing to people who need it, but haven't come to the recognition or awareness that these are useful tools that can help them? Mm -hmm. I see it as a really practical way to get people to start to engage with the substance, so they then educate themselves, about what they're getting into with the idea that if they feel comfortable, they'll then go have that high dose experience. But what I'm hearing from you is let's focus on the high dose experience because that's really where the transformation comes. And if we try to meet people halfway, so to say, it could significantly dilute the actual profundity of psychedelics. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think there's no one way to like, there's a, there's a place for microdosing and there's a place for your five grams and total darkness. Like actually Brian Norman, the, the founder of Symposia also told me the other day, he's like, that's a bad idea to take five grams. That's a recipe for psychosis. Like, and you know, that's also true. So they each have their sort of ups and downs. Um, uh, so yeah. Sophia, yes. what is psychedelic feminism to you? Mm, psychedelic feminism. Well, um, Zoe Helen has been sort of talking about psychedelic feminism for a while. And what I understand it to be is sort of this place where it's a movement to have women in this conversation about psychedelics. And I don't know Zoe's exactly exact definition of it, but intuitively to me, it's basically this idea that the psychedelic movement has to have diversity, um, a plurality of voices, women, you know, everybody. Um, kind of at the front lines of it and it needs to be built in from the bottom up or else it's not it's not just going to like fix itself later on as it does go mainstream um yeah and for me i think this whole psychedelic feminism <clears throat> my my perspective of it is that it's very much it's closely linked with eco-feminism so also the idea that women having been oppressed happened with the oppression of the earth as well so sort of the extraction of women's reproductive labor without you know good compensation or same thing for the Earth's natural resources. So these things are linked very closely together. Um, and this is at least the, the this is my version of feminism. And I think that there are many different feminisms, not all of which I agree with. Um, so yeah, when we're talking about plant medicines, teacher plants, new ecological worldviews, um, how does being a woman figure into that? And how does, you know, how does making sure that women aren't exploited also factor into how we're going to kind of make a more robust ecological system. And when you say exploited, what do you mean by 
Why well, not? for example, yeah, I mean, there's, there's this feminist economics talk about reproductive labor. So, you know, behind the scenes, behind every great man, there's like a woman cooking and cleaning and this and this and that. And I think it was Benjamin Franklin's sister who was like total badass and she was doing amazing things as well. And she was a scientist, but she couldn't follow her bliss because she had duties to do at home. Um, and this reproductive labor is considered unpaid later labor, and it's not recognized as something that's valuable. All of these women's names aren't, you know, etched into the into the stones, as it were. Um, and yeah, so that's what I mean when I talk about kind of exploitative labor. And it's not overtly, but it def. I mean, sometimes it definitely is. But when we start to see that there is there is there are delicate workings that happen behind the scenes. If we begin to notice that, we also notice that, you know, the, the earth gives us things that we take for granted. It's I think they're very closely related. I will say that definitely with these plant medicines comes um, unavoidably a conversation of if these plant spirits do have feminine or masculine energies. If that's so, what does that mean? Um, is that like oppressive somehow? Is that an old is that a vestige of Catholicism that, you know, these are patriarchal conditions, like traditions in the north of the Amazon versus elsewhere? Um, who knows, really? Who really knows? And then, of course, there's another question, something that I've been researching for the book is um, menstruating women. How does this factor into traditional ayahuasca ceremonies? Because oftentimes there are sort of strict religious tenets that say that menstruating women you know, on their moon should not participate in prayer. And you have feminists who say, well, hold on a minute. That's, that's not right. I'm, I'm, I can do what I want for myself. I personally actually lean towards saying, well, you know, I will respect their tradition. Cause it's if based they, in probably some element of wisdom. Or, maybe. Or yeah. Wisdom experience. Or, okay. Yeah. And um, again, this is my limited experience with the sequoia for example is that there are just a few elder shamans left there and they you know say that they're extremely sensitive to the energy of a menstruating woman to the point where these old guys bowl over their hammocks and get splitting migraines if somebody has a drop of blood right so say what you will but i'm not about to start telling these guys that they're wrong when they're kind of at the last of their um their religious lineage, as it were. I think there's much to be learned there. That, that Having said that, that doesn't mean that you can't have a conversation with these people about it and ask them critically what's going on. But I do remember once this guy said to me, and he's a Seguaya guy, somebody was saying, uh, what's, what's the one advice, one piece of advice you would give to Western people? And he would say, don't let menstruating women touch your food. Like, that's the one piece of advice he gave to, to modern people you know, Western people. <laughs> Which is ridiculous. Well, yeah, and to us, right? But to him, it was obviously so important that that's the first thing that he said. So you've got to wonder, wow, what kind of, geez, I don't know, what kind of universe supports that kind of thought? And to me, that's what I'm interested in. Because this gets back into the conversation that we were having earlier about are we really just providing resources to local indigenous people so they can build the world that they need to build? Or are we imposing Western values yeah. on them that are based in a scientific, probably materialist reductionist framework? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's not one or the other. I think it's likely both. But what's the balance there? Especially when you have, you know, I think a lot of people who are listening to this would be like, well, some things that indigenous people do are not necessarily great. You yeah. know, like I know, for example, the Maasai still practice genital mutilation on, mm -hmm. on their women. Yeah, that's very, very tricky, tricky territory. Um, but I would actually be interested in the future and like studying more of these things kind of taboos are fascinating, right? What, what is taboo for one culture is not for another. Um, and especially with this realm of psychedelics, when you have, you know, white blonde girls like me waltzing into villages in the middle of the Amazon and I'm like, whoa, why do you guys do that kind of thing? This is where we really encounter our, um, yeah, there's the permaculturists have this term called the edge. And it's used to describe when two discrete ecosystems meet. So, for example, like a coral reef is an edge. So you'll have 
it's the place where the shallow shores and the deep seas come together and there's biological diversity there. So they're places of tension, but they're also places of creation and collaboration and all of this other stuff like that. So I have the feeling that in engaging with these taboos, these edges, these kind of trickier intercultural spaces, if you can navigate them with the intention of coming out alive <laughs> and communicating, then we could create really, really cool and even more robust knowledge about menstruation, for example, or dieting or whatever it may be, right? We learn more if we... And then from an anthropologist's perspective, yes. I'm going to just throw this out there. Jared Diamond, who I'm sure you're familiar with, mm -hmm. who wrote Guns, Germs, and Steels, also wrote a really good book, which name, uh, the name of it always eludes me. Um, but it compares, do you know which book I'm talking I about? I do, actually. Yeah, I it compares modern and primitive ways of like warfare and diet, child rearing. And it kind of talks about what are the pros and cons of each. In other words, what can we learn from uh, indigenous societies? Uh, and what can we take from, you know, a modern context? Mm -hmm. uh, what are the, the pros and cons with both? Because I think ultimately that gets into the, the, the bigger question that we've kind of been surfacing around and just going in and out of, which is, how do we combine indigenous wisdom, even if it's around psychedelics, with the modern scientific mm -hmm. framework that we now mm -hmm. have to actually make calculated, yeah. rational decisions? Yeah. That's and I don't think you have to look farther than like mestizo communities in the Amazon as well, who, you know, work in urban, sometimes they work in cities, but they are so they're also descendants of indigenous traditions. I mean, if you look at mestizo shamanism, again, Stefan Byers singing to the plants, incredible book. He talks about these in like this hybridized shamanic technology where people are using stethoscopes in ceremony and they are performative tools to a certain extent, but they also show how shamanism is itself such a diverse and kind of changing um, and adaptable uh, practice, human practice, as it were. So I realize that I've been giving a very strong emphasis on like indigenous, but I also realize that that line is very, very much blurred um, in the realm of like ayahuasca, for example. So as a wrap up, let's just, I'd love to hear a little bit more about, yeah. you know, plans for the next year for you. And then also like, you know, we're all very excited about what's coming in the future for psychedelics. So yes. like, I'd also love to hear just five years, seven years from now, kind of what's your vision for your work and what impact you want to have? Well, the first thing is the book, When Plants Dream. So that's next year. I love psychedelics. I love this conversation. I love this frontier and I'd like to be involved in it in some respect as long as it has a social justice orientation. Again, I'm, I'm not interested in being a part of a social movement that isn't like trying to be creative and make new solutions and stuff. So I would love to write more about this kind of stuff, um, bring a more sort of intersectional perspective. So talk about the work that you know, for example, what, what happens if profits from ayahuasca retreat centers are then put into uh, land demarcation, you know, language revitalization, all these different things. So I, I, my big dream is to, like, find some sort of a financial framework that could actually help people on their own terms, right? At least, like, get clean water and, and, and have food and energy sovereignty, that would be the bomb. Um, and how that happens, I'm not so sure. I have pieces and parts kind of put together, but I don't know how happy I would be having like a seven year path. Um, in the future, I would like to do a PhD um, and probably on the political economy of ayahuasca. So really getting into like the, the history of its extraction and then the futures. And, you know, I mean, we already see the exponential rate of its popularity now. Actually, if it, whoever's listening to this, I highly recommend going on Google Trends and typing in ayahuasca retreat to just see like the freaking exponential spike in searches. It's crazy. Right. So I, I'm very curious to see what what that actually looks like um, in, in Peru, basically. In the, what's, Specifically in Peru. In, yeah, because I think it's been called the Mecca of the boom, right? It's really where people are, are going. Most of these retreat centers are very highly concentrated mm -hmm. in Iquitos and that kind of jungle city over there. Um, but again, I don't have any solid research questions yet, only kind of intimations into the flows of, cool. of energy happening over there. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks so much for sitting down. And Thank you. I know we've oh. had a number of chats anyway, so it's cool to do this Yeah. in a more public sphere. Yes. And um, it was... 
just yeah such a pleasure yeah honor. let's do this again in seven sit years and for see sure we can do happens. this again in seven years <laughs> if the podcast is still going at that right. point we'll definitely like have we'll you be back broadcasting on. it with bats sonar probably <laughs> yeah something very techno technodelic Te- techno nature yeah, yeah, techno nature techno shamanistic <laughs> that's yeah, it techno that's shamanistic it. that's totally it. cool well thanks again Samantha. thank you